And this guy here is Jerry Leninger, a Navy flight surgeon, a medical doctor that was going up to replace John. And on the right side there is Marsha Ivan. She was a flight test engineer for NASA before she became an astronaut. We launched in the middle of the night, um, I think somewhere around 2.30 in the morning. And the reason we did that is because, you know, when you're going to rendezvous with another spacecraft in orbit, you can, launch, you can only launch when the uh, plane of their orbit passes over your launch site. And that happens twice a day, usually. Um, and so you have to pick one of those times. And so there's other considerations like the lighting at the time of docking and that sort of thing. So we ended up at 2.30 uh, at night for a liftoff. If you've never had a chance to go see a launch, I highly recommend it. You know, of course, you won't be able to see the Space Shuttle launch anymore, but uh, there are other launches, a lot of SpaceX launches, and those are really cool to see because the first stage of that rocket comes back and lands where pretty much where it took off from. So this is the Space Shuttle just after uh, liftoff. And uh, I use this picture to tell you a little bit about the ascent and how we get to space. So we have, we had three main engines on the Space Shuttle were liquid propellant engines, and the propellant was in this big orange external tank. And then we had solid, two solid rocket motors, one on each side. So what happens is about six seconds before launch, we ignite the main engines and they come up to 100% of their thrust level. Uh, the computers take a quick look at them and then we light the solid rocket motors. And when that happens, you jump off the latch pad at about two and a half times acceleration of gravity or 2.5 Gs. It's a big kick. Uh, I know it's sometimes hard to understand exactly what 2.5 Gs means, but maybe, it, I think it might be a little bit easier to think about an aircraft carrier, an aircraft being catapulted off an aircraft carrier. That's about two and a half Gs of acceleration. And it lasts for about three or four seconds. But this, uh, when the solid rocket motors burn for about two minutes. So the first two minutes of the flight were basically at two and a half Gs. And then the propellant, well actually we we'll go backwards a little bit. The, uh, the solid rocket motors, they burn really rough. So during that portion of the flight, every, there's a lot of vibration, a lot of noise, and a lot of acceleration. And then, so when the propellant's all used up, um, we jettisoned those solid rocket motors and they fell into the ocean on parachutes and were picked up and used on subsequent flights. At that point, it got really smooth and the acceleration dropped from 2.5 Gs down to like 0.8 Gs. Almost felt like we stopped, you know? And then as we used that propellant in the external tank, we accelerate out to three Gs, and that occurred at about seven and a half minutes into the flight. Very smooth, and you just an increase, slowly increase in uh, acceleration in G levels. And then at seven and a half minutes, we, we have to throttle back to maintain three Gs, because that was a structural limitation of the space shuttle. And then at eight and a half minutes, we're going 17,500 miles per hour. That always amazes me when I say it, I still can't believe it to this day almost. It's five miles a second. Uh, then we're pretty much, the, all the propellant's gone, we shut down the main engines, we go from 3Gs to 0Gs and we're in space. It's pretty amazing actually. And then uh, the next thing we do is uh, we uh, separate from the external tank. The external tank begins to tumble slowly and it breaks into pieces and it was fall, pieces that fall into the Indian Ocean. And then the next thing we do is open up the payload bay doors. We have these big radiators in the payload bay doors. Uh, we keep the payload facing the earth, and this is all for thermal conditioning reasons. Plus, it's a lot easier for us inside to look at the earth out the windows. So I, this picture, I'll stay on this picture for a while because it's got a lot of stuff I want to talk about. But first, we'll talk about the things in the payload bay. This is the docking mechanism. So this is where we actually attached ourselves to the space station. In the back of the payload bay, you see this big uh, white box called Space Hat. That's where we had 5,000 pounds of cargo located and stored in there. Uh, we had clothing and food and spare parts, uh, experiments for the space station. And it was connected to the front of the, st of the shuttle with the, about a 40-foot tunnel, which you'll see in a minute. The other thing I want to talk about is our beautiful planet and looking at the Earth. You never get tired of looking at the Earth from space. Um, I remember on my first flight, one of the things that struck me uh, the most was how deep, dark black space is. And it's the deepest, darkest black I've ever seen. And then the other thing that hits you right away is how fragile in our beautiful planet is and looks, and uh, you can see this very, very thin atmosphere. It's just incredible to see. It makes you think, you know, we feel really lonely out in this deep void of space by ourselves, and uh, you know, the world is, you see how connected it is and, um, and how we need to take care of it and live peacefully on it. But we'll talk a lot more about it because that's my favorite thing is looking out the window 
uh, the next favorite thing about being in space is being floating around in zero gravity. It's just pure, simple fun, like being a kid again. And we had all this extra room to be able to roam around in the shuttle. We had a lot of fun with this tunnel. You could get on one end and grab the edges and just, you know, catapult yourself down the other end. It was a lot of fun. So on day two is when we started to get serious about the rendezvous. This is what the space station looked about a mile away. It's a very slow process. We approach it very, very slowly and uh, carefully. So that's me at the bottom looking out the overhead windows and there you can see the station again as we get closer. And here's just another shot as we get a little bit closer. And this orange module you'll see right there is where we were trying to uh, aim for. That was our target. That's a, that orange module was a, called a docking adapter. It was what we flew up on the very first shuttle mission that went there to allow us to dock to the station. And this is what it looked like when we finally got docked. In the foreground, you see this big, large solar array panel that collect energy from the sun, turn it into electricity to power the station. And this end of the solar array was only about three feet out our overhead window. This is the main base block of the station. You can see a little porthole there. That's where the cosmonaut sleeping quarter was. And we'll, later on, we'll see some pictures looking from that portal back at the shuttle. And then again, you can still see our beautiful planet. Um, this is the Pacific Ocean and the west coast of South America that's chilly, looking south along the Andes Mountains. <laughs> now this is basically the same picture uh, with the wide angle lens. And I, I put this in there to remind me to tell you about the, the lenses that we use. You know, a 50 millimeter lens is kind of what it looks like to the naked eye looking out the window. Um, we have a lot of pictures up with a 100 millimeter lens, which is, makes it about 50 miles across on the Earth. And then sometimes we even use a 300 millimeter lens for very close up photos. So after we docked, we opened some valves to equalize the pressure between the station and the space shuttle, uh, which actually took about an hour and a half or two hours, as I recall. And then we were able to open up the hatch and say hello to the crew inside. I've been having a little bit of trouble with our slide changer. Francie, are you around still somewhere? There we go. I think it might need a battery in this thing. Um, that's Jeff in the base block, just to give you an idea what the base block of the space station looked like. That's the general control center, the living room, dining room. Uh, most of the activity took place inside of here. The station had been on orbit for about 11 years when we got there. It was only designed to be on orbit for five years. It ended up staying on orbit for 15 years. And just uh, as a comparison, the International Space Station was designed for 15 years and it's already been on orbit for about 22 years. And we hope to operate it until at least, I think, 2028 right now. So we do this de orbit burn. We have to dissipate a lot of energy. We, know we're, we weigh 220,000 pounds. We're going 17,500 miles an hour. So we turn, uh, we're about halfway around the world, over Australia somewhere, usually. We'll turn the space shuttle around, point our orbital maneuvering system engines at the velocity vector, and we'll light the engines, ignite them, and we'll run those engines at about, for about four minutes. And that slows us down. And when we slow down, we start to fall out of your orbit. And then uh, we fall for the next 30 minutes until we hit the atmosphere, and, you know, kind of decelerating. And then we start to decelerate. So when we hit the atmosphere, it's a bit, the entry is extremely smooth. And the, uh, the acceleration or deceleration comes on really, really slowly until we, and then we were slowing down and descending all the way to about 50,000 feet uh, and get below Mach 1 when we're overhead our landing airfield. And that's when we took over control and we flew around a heading alignment circle, they called it, to line up on the runway, which is where we get the highest G, about 1.4 Gs for the entry. And so we're at a 20 degree dive angle, uh, going about 300 knots. And then at about 2,000 feet, we do what we call the pre-flare, where we reduce the dive angle from 20 degrees to three degrees, which is about what a normal glide path is for an airliner. And then uh, as we pass through 400 feet, we're still decelerating, we lower the landing gear, uh, for a touchdown, about 195 knots on the end of the runway. And then we lower the nose at 185, put the drag chute out, and come to a, whoop, one more, there we go, and come to a stop. And uh, I'm gonna stop right there, and I think we're almost out of time. May have time for one question or so? Anybody's got yep, we've got time for just one.
<laughs> What's the difference in feeling like being in an airplane or on a space shuttle? To be honest, not much. Uh, as a pilot, I could go into a more longer <laughs> explanation, but you know, the, the space shuttle was one of the first fly-by-wire airplanes. It wasn't the first one. Like the F-16 was probably the first fly-by-wire airplane. And um, you can kind of do whatever kind of control system you want with them. But um, our guys decided to do an attitude control system. So that just means, I mean, a rate control system, excuse me, rate control system. So that means when you pull back on the stick, it gives you a certain rate. And then in, in, when you're flying an airplane in roll, when you move the stick over, you, you get a certain roll rate. You put the stick over more, you get a faster roll rate. But in pitch, a real airplane is more like an attitude control. But so the space shuttle, when you pull back on the stick, it just kept going, you know, it gave you a rate. So that was unusual and something that you had to get used to. And we trained, you know, we had lots of simulators and training aircraft to get us used to that. So as a pilot, it was a little bit different. Plus the shuttle, it, it, when you rolled, it felt like a big transport airplane. It was kind of sluggish, but in the pitch, uh, it, control was very much like a big agile fighter plane. So it, it was different as a pilot, but as a passenger, I don't think much different <laughs> in, terms of, in terms of landing. Anyway.